Okay, moving on. This week at the agenda, examine fact, nonfiction, and prize-winning books, weighed Canada's future military role, and asked why the Great Lakes are losing water. The agenda's week in review begins with the question, what should a teacher's role be? Watch. When Ontario's teachers decided to fight Bill 115 by withdrawing extracurriculars from their students' lives, that got many people wondering, just what is a teacher's job? From coaching to field trips to maintaining curriculum standards, what should teachers be expected to do, and what do they think they should do? Joining us now to debate that, Earl Manners, Human Resources Administrator at the Trillium Lakelands District School Board. George Thomas, Elementary Teacher with the York Region District School Board. Stephen Hurley, Elementary Teacher with the Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board. Misha Abarbanel, Secondary Teacher with the Toronto District School Board. Royan Lee, elementary teacher with the York Region District School Board, and Zoe Brannigan Pipe, elementary teacher with the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board. What is it about extracurriculars uh, that is so amazing? And why does it why does it supposedly leave such a void? And I have to admit, even though I, ha I, I wouldn't call myself a grizzled veteran, you know, I do feel like I've been in the profession for quite a while. How long? Um, almost 10 years okay. now. And, um, uh, but still, I was surprised um, this year when I discovered uh, how painful the loss of extracurriculars was. Painful and to whom? To um, various people. You know, we, we heard so many people come out and speak about it, parents, uh, from students, teachers, and, and other stakeholders, in fact. And so it, it made me think, you know, what is it about extracurricular activities that, that, um, that that is so great, and I and I broke it down, and I thought, well, let's think about it. in extracurriculars. There's no curriculum, right? Theoretically, because that's why it's a so the teachers have a great deal of autonomy autonomy to right. do their own thing. Okay. There is um, no real standardized assessment. There is um, it tends to be growth orientated. Mm -hmm. So we tend to like like you were mentioning um, when you have that student. Who, 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 who you see achieve something so spectacular or experience a certain kind of failure that is a, a momentous learning so experience. So that's why we love it. Yeah, that's why we love it. And, and uh, numerous other things. So I thought, so if we took that away and we, we are pining for it to return, then does it mean that our classrooms and our regular timetable are not serving those needs, those those learning needs. So the, what I'm trying to say is, is this a topic, is it a conversation about extracurriculars or does it really, is it a red herring for a real conversation on, like what are we doing with learning okay, in so class? Let's go, let's go, we, yeah. I'm gonna have Misha, then Stephen, then Zoe. With all due respect, I don't see that there's any point in extolling the virtues of extracurricular activities because I think we all agree that they're phenomenally important and part of a, an enriched education, which is our primary concern at this table. But um, Earl, referred to the greater good earlier. And, and on that note, you know, I, I think one of the reasons that teachers are, some teachers are choosing to um, continue to withhold that third category of, of extracurricular activity um, is a, a, a very strong sense of the greater good and with an emphasis on the long term. So um, a, a predisposition to, to say, um, if, I, if, <laughs> if I continue to do my job um, in exactly the same fashion as I did before this unfortunate set of circumstances, um, I'm sending the message that I'm willing to do the same job for 10% less. And you don't want to look like a pushover. Well, I exactly. And I, we sit on a slippery slope because if I'm willing to do the same job for 10% less, then I must be willing to do the same job for 15% less. What is it that extracurricular gives not only the individual student, but groups of students and the school community? And I think that's really essential. And I don't think not to not to diminish what goes on in the classroom i don't think you can get there from just the classroom experience uh, for the very reasons that royan has has indicated the autonomy and the, the not, and, and i'd love to build some of that into the regular classroom program but i i learned so much about myself from people that were willing to put the time in i learned to play guitar uh, from a teacher in grade eight that taught me how to play the guitar. And that was not in the curriculum. It wasn't in the curriculum. It was on the stage at St. Martin's Junior School. Uh, I learned uh, that I was passionate about radio and television uh, when I was in grade nine, when we had some teacher, uh, Mr. Skidmore, who decided he was gonna run a mock election around election time. And I was in my glory when I walked out of that control room 
of course, I, I took down the whole program by tripping over the main wire, but <laughs> I learned, and that was a passion that has, it, it hasn't gone away, and that's through the extra curriculum. Zoe the Neural. You know, I, I have to say I really resonate with what Roy Ann was saying in regards to the whole school community and how, um, you know, an event like this, what's happened in education um, with these extracurricular um, not being done has, has actually strengthened the community um, big time in, in my school as well. And I, you know, strengthened I, I, the whole community, Zoe? Um, I, I would say that when you walk down the halls now, teachers are talking a lot about, um, about bringing some of the activities that they would have done in the extracurricular into their classrooms. So, you know, it, you, you struck it just, just today, a, a teacher came to me and said, you know, normally the school yearbook would be an extracurricular activity, but I think that I'm going to make that as part of my lead, media literacy program. What do you think? You know, and, you know, and then the, the teacher across the hall coming to me and saying, hey, you know, why don't we um, integrate a, a, you know, a collaborative activity between our two classes that normally we would have done outside the classroom. So I think what it is is that teachers are starting to use more authentic, as I think you use the word authenticity, um, choice. Um, students are starting to feel like they, um, they're doing, the, the school's more fun Do because- Do you not worry though that you are violating, in some respects, your union's directive not to provide these services? I, I, I think that I'm not looking at it that way because I'm looking at it in a, in a, in a way that we are stopping and we are reevaluating what education is. And this, this pause is giving teachers a chance to stop and reevaluate the big picture about what we should be doing in education. Earl. So. I, I think the debate about whether extracurricular activities are extra or not is, is uh, taking away from the fact that the boycott <laughs> is uh, addressing a whole lot of other things that are part of the normal life of a school. Mm -hmm. Nutrition programs for needy kids are certainly part and parcel of a good education. I think everyone would agree to that. Providing excursions to the local fair or to local businesses to involve the kids in the community. Certainly everyone would agree that that's part of the curriculum and that shouldn't be boycotted, yet it is. Uh, enrichment opportunities like going to our overnight outdoor education center or participating in Meet a We, where in our board the Meet a We organization actually has their one of their main headquarters and we have a relationship, a direct relationship with them. Those are things that are part of education and in part of the learning experience and the pursuit of learning that teachers are supposed to be involved in. And yet in a situation where there's a, where there, there's not to be any strikes, those kinds of activities are being, uh, teachers are being told not to participate in. And I think they're doing exactly what you're suggesting. How do I get around that directive? By bringing them into the classroom, because ETFO in particular, and that's where our, our case is addressed at, is saying that only things in the classroom count, and that's wrong. George. I wanted to say, uh, just touch on a couple of points that have been said. Um, one of the ones, like Roy was saying about your staff morale and everything, you see, we found the opposite. We found that staff morale was down. People didn't really find it, find it that exciting to come to work anymore. Um, the kids' morale was down. We found behaviors increasing, effort in classes dropping. Sorry, bad, bad behavior increasing? Yes, exactly. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, bad behavior increasing. Um, you know, effort in class because... I could use that as, as the basketball coach and say, listen, you've got to go to class. I'm not saying you've got to get an A, but you've got to put an effort in, and you can't cause a ruckus, and you've got to you know, do what's right. And, and, but part of the thing about the extracurriculars, too, is that some of those kids, what we did in practice, what we learned about, preparation, teamwork, collaboration, okay, now you're going to use that in the classroom as well. You see how successful it was in the basketball so court? So bring it there. The, the, the carrot of, unless your marks are good, you can't play basketball. Well, it's not marks good. It's not about marks. For me, it's never about marks. It's about, it's about effort. Because okay. the same thing I say about the basketball court. We don't have to win, but i got to see you put your best effort forward. And if we put our best effort forward and we lose every game, that was our best effort. That's right. all you can do. Let's open this up for discussion now, and I want to start by saying the four of you, and I guess uh, the five of you when, uh, when Ross is with you, have spent a lot of time together, I'm guessing, lately, right? And you've all heard each other talk about each other's books, and you've talked to each other about each other's books, and you've all written about very disparate subjects, but I wonder if in the course of hearing you all talk about each other's work, you've thought, actually, I deal with that theme too. I have that similarity too. 
That comes up in my book, too. Uh, I'm kind of just fishing here, but Tim, have you seen any of that? As you look at these other books, do you think, oh, yeah, you've dealt <laughs> with that, too, and yeah. so have I. Does any of that well, come I did, up? Well, I, I read Andrew's book um, and all the books. and I, Which and one's I, better? <laughs> <laughs> I won't go down that road. I will say that I, I found it fascinating to read uh, both Woodrow Wilson and uh, FDR and to think of how religion and to look back at what I wrote about Borden and King. And, and King was a very religious man. He, uh, he read the Bible every day. He could quote passage and scripture. And um, he was guided often by what he felt was a, a divine mission in life, which is one of the reasons why he, he actually goes to visit Hitler in 19. 37. He thought that they were both spiritual men. Unlike Churchill, who never met him. Uh, that's right, who refused yeah. to. And, and so, uh, there, uh, King, uh, there was a lot, uh, religion guided King in his personal life, and it's throughout his diaries, and I re read the, uh, them, the 5,000 pages, um, I didn't see it in that same foreign policy uh, bent, but I will go back now with new <laughs> eyes, which I think is one of the great things about books, of course, is that every book you read, you then go back and look at some of the primary source material and think, oh, there it is. Or in this case, it's a little different in Canada. Mm. And we were lucky last night, and, and Andrew was saying that, of course, Britain has a very different bent, and I think yeah. Canada does as well. But I think the scholarship isn't quite there, so we, we're not quite sure. Hmm. Now you and you have, of course, <laughs> both written books about cultural Yes. legends yes. in the country's history. So have you done some comparing of notes here to see if there are any similarities? Well, we, we have a project now. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah. A collaboration yeah, as a we, result well, of? Well, it's just a very tiny project. Okay. But someone asked us, do you think that Celia and PK Page ever met? Mm. Uh, it, which is very interesting because as two sort of cultural icons and I sort of went, oh no, I don't think, and then we started to talk about it. So that's our project to see to find out if, if they did, if they, if they had ever met. They both served terms at the Canada Council uh, in the 70s, so we have to cross-reference that and see if there was any time when they were, you know, together on that. Oh, we're not sure if they were on it at the same time. No, we don't know no, that. We're going okay. to, that's a, a, a that's delicious research project Wonderful. for us, yeah. Wouldn't that be neat if they had met? Yeah. <laughs> but there's a, there's a religious element in my book, too. Oh, all right. <laughs> no, so there's no, connections uh, here. No, but I mean, a lot of people did ask, I mean, a lot of people were surprised that uh, Celia Franca was Jewish uh, mm -hmm. because um, the, her hair coloring and her name, everyone thought she was Italian, or I had a, someone just say, oh, she was Brazilian or Cuban. And, no, she was, um, she was Jewish, but when she came to Canada uh, in the early 1950s, um, she, there was uh, uh, anti-Semitism in England, of course, mm -hmm. but there was in Canada very much as well. And I think um, a lot of people didn't realize that she was Jewish and made sort of, uh, aside remarks of anti-Semitic uh, anti nature. And for a little at the beginning, she said she had to think about this, whether she was prepared to stay or to go home on that, on that aspect. Mm -hmm. But um, she remained, but she never, and she has a, her family, uh, of, of which there are many members still alive. That was something else I found out in the book, that she did have um, extended family, first cousins who are still alive in Israel. Mm -hmm. And um, her, her mother and father, especially her mother, were, they were very disappointed that she, was, she did not practice her faith. Are you saying we now have a joint project? I think so, <laughs> yes. Very good. Yeah. Well, and the other great revelation, of course, is that P.K. Page was also Jewish. No, no she wasn't. No, I'm just kidding. There's but no the great compare. revelation was that she had a very strong, visionary, mystic life, that she was a Sufi, or at least she read Sufi material. She would never claim to be a Sufi. And what kind of influence did that have on her? It certainly influenced her poetry. I think it gave her a discipline, a discipline and metaphors for her poetry, and I think perhaps a confirmation of her early belief, a belief that she had from when she was very young, that there were other worlds, parallel worlds maybe, but hmm. other you worlds. You've that in common with Mackenzie King. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes but See, it's uh, all coming together here. <laughs> but PK always did not let her on the, well, she was not a person like Mackenzie King who didn't know um, let her on the one hand know what her on the other hand mm. was doing. She knew what she was doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let me ask all of you now about what it's like in this country for authors. And Carol, why don't you start? How easy or tough is it to get a book published in this country? 
Well, I, I'm a first time author too, so you know, everyone else is quite an experienced author. Um, it was very difficult uh, to, to find someone who would be interested in uh, publishing a book about a ballet dancer. Did you get a lot of rejections on it? Uh, I didn't get a lot of acceptances, yes, <laughs> you know. And then my first publisher, of course, was Key Porter, who unfortunately went bankrupt. We're losing, it's just so sad, you know, we're mm -hmm. just losing day by day uh, publishing companies, independent publishing companies in Canada. So it is. It was hard, it was hard, but I did have a cormorant who um, went with me and um, and I think, you know, someone like Celia Franca and P.K. Page um, did have deserved, you know, deserved to be recognized. But th that's my follow-up question because, yes, they lived the kinds of lives that deserve to be chronicled in a book, but are the realities of the business of publishing books today such that it's extremely difficult to get a book published about these kinds of people? Well, they represent art. And not only do they represent art, they represent what's seen as high art, ballet and poetry. Is there an audience for that in Canada anymore? There is, but it is rather small. Hmm. It's partly because we ha are raising generations of students who don't really read, hmm. who have not learned to read through images, through metaphors, or even to read a long, solidly researched book. New decisions are being made, given the fiscal realities in the country, and we are not investing many new billions of dollars in our military uh, in the way that we did, perhaps, say, a decade ago. And so, in that same Big Ideas lecture, you have uh, essentially put forward the case that our military are now facing a new function, which is what? There's a new forcing function arising, and that is budget reductions. Now, ordinarily, generals would huff and puff and say, no, it's not a good idea to reduce the monies allocated to any military force because you always want to essentially better prepare and equip your troops for what's going to happen tomorrow. And no one, quite frankly, can predict with certainty where we're going to go next, be it home or overseas. Having said that, the forcing function of budgetary reductions has the potential to be an excuse to transform the Canadian forces in certain cases from what they're doing now, the way they're structured, the process they have, the amount of money they spend on overhead, into something leaner, better, faster, smarter. Leaner, better, faster, smarter, and therefore capable of doing what going forward? Certainly not Afghanistan, right? They would be capable of doing a mission much akin to Afghanistan. For 10 years? The reason why the armed forces were able to sustain the mission in Afghanistan for so long resides on the people, which were the most fragile element in the loop, tis always us. And in this case, the reserve organizations, air, land, and sea, augmented the regular forces in the multiple thousands. And I sincerely hope that the reserve model is not attacked or reduced in training because that is essentially the lifeblood of making sure that any mission the government chooses to send their armed forces on can be sustained over the longer term. Canada's military finds itself facing budget cuts of an estimated one to two and a half billion dollars. As Andrew Leslie just described, he thinks this is a golden opportunity for our military to transform into a leaner, more efficient and effective force. Is it possible for Canada to fight more with less? Joining us to help answer that question from the nation's capital, Stephen Sademan, Patterson Chair in International Affairs at Carleton University, and with us here in studio, Jenna Stein, TVO's Foreign Affairs Analyst and Executive Director of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the U of T. Janice, good to see you. Stephen, first time on the program. Nice to have you there in the nation's capital. I want to My just pleasure. start by reading something that Canadian Press reported the other day and uh, take it from there. A set of estimates tabled in Parliament on Monday ahead of this spring's federal budget shows the Harper government anticipates the overall defense spending will shrink in the coming year to $17.9 billion. That's down $2.3 billion from what was actually spent in 2011-2012. Let's unpack that a bit if we can. Janice, what do you think the effect of a cut of that size will be? That's a significant cut, Steve. That's, as you just said, 10% of the overall budget. A little um, more, actually. And it's a little more. And actually, when you think about this budget, um, you need to understand that the defense budget, like every other budget, so much is wrapped up already. One, in salaries, which you cannot cut, and two, in long-term capital commitments, which are made over time. So when you've got to cut this amount out of a budget and your discretionary spend 
uh, is not great, um, that can really hurt principally in two areas, really. First of all, in readiness. So your capacity to move on a dime, to deploy people in any kind of crisis goes down. And the second area where our militaries do this over and over and over again in a crunch like this, they cut back on training. Hmm. And that's short-term gain for long-term pain. Stephen, the effect of these cuts in your view? Well, the Canada couldn't even afford what it had planned to do, even if it wasn't cutting the budget, that the, the choice to uh, recapitalize the Navy and buy the F-35s and do everything else to get the Canadian military into the 21st century wasn't gonna, was unaffordable at $20 billion, not to mention $18 billion. So it's going to be really tough on the things that Janice talked about, that the, the Canadian forces will not be able to train, they will not be able to, to practice. It's going to really cut into their ability to do what, they, what their job is, which is to be ready for whatever contingency that comes up. So, Stephen, if they told you, come on in here, take a look at what we're doing, and you make the cuts, where would you make the cuts? Oh, that's a tough question. Uh, but since I have tenure, I guess my, my answer would be uh, I'd first start looking at things that don't work and things that aren't really all that... Uh, that Canada already underprovides. So I'd say take a look at the submarines. The submarines are very expensive. Uh, it's not clear what four submarines buy as a country this size. Take a look at other aspects. I mean, the real choice is that Canada's got to choose which elements of the military it really needs down the road to be 21st century. Does it need an army that's that level, an air force that's level, or a navy that's level? It can't do all three. Can you, Janice, cut the defense budget and not have it affect readiness? I really don't believe you can. Can't you just say we're going to be ready for some things but not others and therefore a cut well, can work? Well, you know, work? I, I think it's really hard in practice and every time I've seen it, it's always affected readiness. But let's bump that question up just one bit. Um, in order to do what you just suggested, Steve, you have to have an overall strategic vision. Mm. And you have to say, yes. and, and that's really key, you have to say, okay, we cannot do it all. We actually can't do more with less, and you know what? We can't do the same with less, um, by and large. Although I do agree, and you're gonna to come to this, I do agree with Andy Leslie that there are headquarters savings that we can make, but I don't think it's 10% of the budget. And once it's not, we then have to make, we have to cut um, operations. In other words, what we have to ask ourselves the really hard question, what are we not gonna do well, over not, the next 15 years. I guess we're not going to be a general all-purpose military anymore. Is uh, that right? I, I don't believe we are, but here's, here's a hot-button issue for me all these years. I do not believe we have been a general all-purpose all -purpose combat military for the last 35 years. Nobody, um, uh, you know, at, at senior levels on, on the military side of the house is willing to acknowledge. But in fact, we've cut capabilities uh, for 30 years. We are not an all-purpose force, but we like to tell ourselves that we're an all-purpose force. And the way we make these decisions, Steve, is in the worst possible way. It's called politics. You log roll among the three services. Okay, Air Force, you're getting that one. Here's, I'm in the Army, I'm getting this one, and you in the Navy, you're getting that one. And there's not an underlying strategic vision about what our military should look like in the 21st century. Stephen, if we are not an all-purpose military today, what are we? Mm -hmm. Well, the Canada can provide some uh, capabilities, and it showed in Afghanistan that it's willing to do something that a lot of its allies aren't willing to do, which is fight on the ground. Uh, in Libya, it was, willing to, it was willing to drop bombs, which a lot of our NATO partners weren't willing to do. And so the question that needs to be asked is not just for today, but not for tomorrow, but all these decisions will be generational right. decisions, will constrain leaders 20 years down the road. So it really depends on what Canada wants to do. If it's about making a difference in the world, uh, one of the things that Canada can do that other countries aren't willing to do is, is engage in combat. But that is politically costly. It, it, sacrifices the ability for the Harper government to control the message. Operations are incredibly expensive. So that might be the easiest choice is to say we're not going to do any ground operations anytime soon, which means cut the size of the military quite significantly by uh, carving into the land forces. We all depend on the Great Lakes for many things. Drinking, shipping, fishing, sailing, tourism, making a living. But levels across all the Great Lakes are unusually low right now, and Lakes Michigan and Huron are at 
historic lows. Joining us now to help get to the bottom of this, in Naples, Florida, via Skype, Paul Cowley. He's president of the Federation of Tiny Township Shoreline Associations. In Ann Arbor, Michigan, via Skype, Drew Gronwald. He is a hydrologist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And with us here in our studio, Mary Muter, chair of the Sierra Club Ontario's Great Lakes section, and Adam Chamberlain. He's an environmental law specialist at Borden Ladner Gervais LLP. And we welcome you two here in our studio and our friends in the United States and points beyond. We thank you for joining us for what, um, what is our contribution on the agenda to Water Week here at TVO. But beyond that, I have heard just over and over and over from people who watch this program, from any time I'm in cottage country, people are constantly wondering why the water levels are so low. And I know there have been constant discussions about this for many years. I want to start by playing a piece of tape from a public hearing in Midland, Ontario, last summer on the record, then record, low water levels for Lake Michigan and Huron and Georgian Bay, Adam, where you've got a cottage. So let's look at that tape and then we'll come back and chat. Roll tape, please, control room. What I see is our water levels going down. I see our fish going away, our deer, all our other four-legged animals, our birds. Now I have a question for you. What do I tell my grandchildren? What do my people tell their grandchildren and the faces yet to come? What do these other non-native people here tell their grandchildren? What happened to the water? What happened to my people when they say our rights for our fishing, our hunting, well, we can't do it anymore because there is no more water. Mary, do you think she has accurately characterized the nature of the problem? Yes, I think she has done a great job. It is, that sounds dire. Is that where we're at? It is, it is, it's very dire. How come? Yes. Um, well, the ecological impacts from our perspective are very significant. We have lost, before the recent drop, we lost 20% of the highest quality wetlands found anywhere in the Great Lakes. When you say we, you mean? We Sierra Club, um, um, in terms of Georgian Bay. Okay. Um, the wetlands um, have lost even more habitat. 80% of Great Lakes fish need wetlands for spawning and our nursery habitat. If they can't find it, they simply don't spawn. We have exposed shorelines where the invasive reed, 10 to 12 feet high, Phragmites has taken over shorelines. In other places where there were wetlands, there are now five and six foot tall pine trees that are basically converting what was a wetland into a forest. Um, M&R have documented the Ministry decline. Ministry of Natural Resources. Ministry of Natural Resources, We yes. hate acronyms here, Mary, so okay. gonna, every time you use one, I'm going to explain what it okay. really means. Um, uh, they've documented the um, declining uh, northern pike fish populations. Uh, last summer, McMaster University, who we work with very closely, um, put tracking devices into muskie, found them swimming many kilometers, well beyond the normal range, trying to find wetlands they could get into. This is again Georgian Bay you're talking? This is again Georgian Bay. Because okay. the water levels have been really near record low for 14 years, the wetlands have shrunk in size, but the plants have become very congested. Uh, so the large fish can't move in and out of them. Um, normally the water levels fluctuate, the plants are more diverse. It opens it up, it allows the fish to move in and out. It's not happening. Hmm. Okay, let me get a report from Drew. You're on Lake Michigan. What can you tell us about the nature of the problem where you are? Well, let's see. So one of the things that uh, we do here at NOAA is we, along with other uh, agencies and groups in the region, track not just Lake Michigan, but we look at all the lakes and we have water level gauging stations across each of the lake systems. And so we're seeing some pretty interesting things happening here, uh, certainly with regards to Lake Michigan and Huron as this one massive linked hydrologic system. We are seeing Michigan and Huron uh, have had extended lows for the past 13 years or so. Interestingly, if you look at the data for the lower lakes, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario have really for the past 13 years been hovering right around their long-term means. Uh, Lake Superior has been uh, below average for about 13 years or so. So we tend to take a big picture perspective on the system to try to understand uh, what's happening. Um, another aspect of what's happening from a big picture perspective, the way we look at it is much of the condition that Lake Michigan and Huron are under right now and the folks uh, 
in, in indicating what's happening in Georgian Bay, really began about 13 years ago when water levels dropped about a meter or so uh, over the course of two to three years. And that really set the stage for the type of um, things we're seeing right now. Do you, Drew, have a good explanation for why you saw that one meter drop, or two to three meter drop, I guess, 13 years ago? Yeah, when you look, when you look at the records, and we're very fortunate in this region to have a long period of record on not just the water levels, but on precipitation, evaporation, and runoff into the lakes. And we can track those over time. And what we saw um, leading up to the high levels of, of the mid-1980s, we saw a general increase in water to the system. And then right around the late 1990s, there was an abrupt shift in the amount of water that entered each of the systems, particularly Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, and Huron. And it's our perspective that that the one meter drop that was seen over the period of that two to three years is largely associated with changes in the water budget. Okay, let's go to Adam next. Adam, you, you've actually got a cottage on Georgian Bay, right? Uh, yeah, I'm very lucky. I have a cottage that I, our family's had for about 100 years, actually. Hmm. So you have heard what Mary had to say about the larger picture. Mm -hmm. From your personal standpoint, does that ring true? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I was a young kid, we used to drive uh, boats uh, around over rocks that now you could walk across. So there's mm -hmm. been significant change in that period. Um, but the change dates back a lot longer than that, too. My grandmother used to tell me stories about when she was a young girl, and back then she could walk across the same rocks that we can now walk across. So I think it's drier now than it was then, but the Great Lakes and, well, the Lake Huron, Georgian Bay, Michigan, they change, uh, they vary quite considerably over time, and they have been for, for a long time. This is not a new phenomenon. Well, that's what I want to see if I can understand better. You say your grandmother could walk on the rocks, and now you're walking on the rocks. Are you here to tell us that what we're experiencing now is essentially cyclical and things will get better? No, I think what I would say is that there are cyclical aspects to the problem. And while I think what I'm hearing, what I'm reading, and what we've heard from Drew also talks about what has happened over the last 13 years as being different. And I think the trick is, and this is always a trick in a complex uh, ecological system, is understanding what is uh, the cycle, what is natural, and what is an unusual change that's happening. And to be honest, I think it's pretty, pretty difficult to understand exactly or to discern what is happening right now. Paul, let me get you to weigh in on that as to whether or not what we're seeing is natural, cyclical, or maybe a combination of each. Well, Steve, I mean, while you can't uh, obviously ignore the environment impact uh, on this problem and, and there's not very much we can do about the environment, what we can do is, is, is work with the things that have been man-made uh, effects, uh, namely the overdredging in the St. Clair River, which are letting excess water flow out of Lake uh, Huron down the St. Clair River, and it's not benefiting the lower lakes, it's simply going out to the ocean and gone. Why are they doing the dredging in the St. Clair River? I beg your pardon? You said that the excess dredging in the St. Clair River is causing some of this. Why is that happening? Well, in the 30s and 60s, there was uh, a lot of dredging done by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and uh, when they dredged the river out, what, they, uh, what happened was there was an increased conveyance in the river. And that increased conveyance served to mine out the bottom even further. So instead of going to what was to be the prescribed 27 feet, in many areas has now gone to over 60 feet, so you have a hugely increased volume of water that's flowing down uh, the St. Clair River and, and uh, draining out of Lake Huron. But can I just understand, are they doing that in order to accommodate bigger ships, or what's the reason? Shipping is, is I think, the main reason that the dredging is done, and, and they continue to do that. Some dredging uh, of a maintenance level is, of course, required every year, but this is has gone well beyond that. And the U.S. Army Corps, I know, recognized that in the 70s when they, they did have authorization following the dredging to place sills in the St. Clair River to stem this flow and adjust for the problem. But unfortunately, uh, our Environment Canada bickered with them over 10 years, over a half inch, if you can imagine, uh, of lake level. And uh, consequently, the U.S. finally withdrew and uh, withdrew the funding. And that is The Agenda's Week in Review. You can see all of those programs in their entirety on our website, theagenda.tvo.org, on our iTunes channel, or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash theagenda. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.